The last video game review I made was for Total War Shogun 2, which is probably the most widely known samurai strategy game to date. However, to say that it is the only samurai strategy game would be pure lies, as another massive samurai strategy game series has existed since 1983 ushering in roughly 15 different titles by the time of me making this video in 2019. I am of course referring to Nobunaga's Ambition. Which you may have realized I use much character art from in my main Sengoku Jidai series. For this review, I will be taking a look at the massively popular 2013 release, Nobunaga's Ambition Sphere of Influence which got its western release only in 2015. There have been Nobunaga's ambition games that have come out since Sphere of Influence, as we can see with Ascension and Tai Chi. However, Sphere of Influence is the most critically successful of the more recent releases, thus it will be the game this review will focus on. Now, being that this game is several years old at the time of me making this video, I'd imagine there are quite a few people watching this video who have played Sphere of Influence, which is great, because this game is extraordinary. Before we dive in, I also want to mention that it is easy to compare many aspects of this game to Shogun 2. However, for this review I want to just discuss this game only, so that we can get a more pure understanding of what makes it so unique. Yet, in the future I do plan on making a separate video that will compare the two games side by side as there really is a lot you can say when looking at both titles. So, with that said, let's dive in. Nobunaga's Ambition is a series which is published by Japanese developer Koei, which is also the same company behind the Dynasty Warriors and Samurai Warriors games, Samurai Warriors being another series I plan to review in the future. Most Nobunaga's Ambition games have been released for game consoles, with the more recent entries coming out for PS4 before receiving a PC release. For this review, I am playing on the PC, because I believe strategy games are much easier to manage with a keyboard and mouse. Now, being a game developed in the East, it vastly separates itself from many of its Western contemporaries. In the same way that JRPGs tend to play much differently than Western RPGs, Japanese strategy games tend to play much differently than Western strategy games. In many Western strategy games, there is a typical formula that is followed, which can be applied to a vast array of settings, be it medieval, modern, or futuristic. We can see the base building styles of Age of Empires, the turn-based conquest games like Total War and Civilization, and of course the grand strategy approach of Paradox games. Sphere of Influence, while still using some aspects of Western strategy games, is, for the most part, unlike any other strategy game around, in that it is essentially built perfectly just for the Sengoku Jidai, Japan's age of warring states. But what do I mean by that? For starters, the game is heavily rooted in history. We can see this through the game's many start dates, cinematic historical events, historical quests, Accurate location names, even in areas that have no settlement. Accurate lifespans. And most importantly, through the hundreds of historically accurate samurai, all with a unique portrait, stats and abilities, and a viewable biography section where you can read the actual history of that particular samurai. As a quick side note, samurai in the game are referred to as officers. When you first start up a game, you can literally choose to play as any clan you want to across the entire map, or even create your own clan and castle, using custom samurai you created in the editor mode. Whichever you choose, you will be thrown into the midst of whatever important event is occurring at that point in time. Obviously, much of the early game centers around Oda Nobunaga's rise to power, yet the game of course goes past his death, and up to the climactic battle of Sekigahara, with the earliest historical start date being at Nobunaga's birth in 1534, and the latest historical start date being the year 1600. There are also additional DLC start dates which allow for even more unique experiences. The first thing you will be treated to when entering a game is the amazing detail-rich and beautiful map of Japan. 
You can also choose to enable extra features to expand your view of information, allowing you to customize and create a user interface that best suits your desires. You will also be greeted with the game's odd music, which is made up of epic orchestral pieces rather than traditional sounding Japanese music. Now, don't get me wrong, most of the music in this game is great, yet there are also some pieces that are a bit overly dramatic and awkward. However, it is still interesting to note that the music changes as you progress throughout the game, with each clan having their own unique theme that evolves over your rise to power. Now, as we get started, I want to mention that this is a very slow game, as it takes time to work towards accomplishing your goals. However, that also makes your victories so much more rewarding. The game works through phases. You make your decisions during a council phase with the rest of your top advisors. They offer you advice and opinions, and it's through this advice that you really begin to understand how the game works rather simply, as its learning curve isn't anything too bad. You manage your towns, castles, and roads, along with making improvements to expand your gathering of food, wealth, and soldiers at each location. What's cool about expanding your cities is that the more you develop them, the more you can actually see when you zoom in and watch the expansion taking place. You can also send your officers off to go and engage in diplomacy, whether it with other clans, local tribes, or even the imperial court. No matter what you do, it seems there will always be more to be done. In fact, there is so much to do that in time, you can end up assigning someone to simply do a bit of it for you. Or put it on auto run so that you don't have to worry about all the management, just leaving it in the hands of your officers. For the playthrough for this review, I decided to play as the Hojo clan, starting in 1534. Seeing as we have been discussing them much in my more recent history videos, Right off the bat, I should mention that if you are interested in a more historically focused game, you will not want to choose the earlier start dates. In my game, the Oda got wiped out by the Matsudaira. The Mori were completely shut out by the Amago. Uesugi Kenshin never came to power and restructured the Uesugi clan. And I simply wiped out the Takeda ASAP. Now, the Hojo clan in 1534 have a very easy start, beginning with five castles granting them plenty of officers and labor to go about getting things done. This is opposed to starting as a clan that only begins the game with one castle, as you will have very limited labor, troops, and supplies, making the initial challenge much harder, and you will need to strategically find ways to become a larger power. However, I should mention that nothing ever seems impossible in this game. As long as you know what you are doing, and create a good, sound plan to accomplish your goals, everything is within your reach. The most important aspect of planning out your conquests is managing your officers effectively. Each officer comes with their own host of strengths and weaknesses, with some being best suited for battle, while others more suited for municipal work or diplomacy. Finding the ones that work best for each scenario is key to creating a powerful and effective clan. You can even pick up traits to teach to your officers to increase their effectiveness in certain scenarios. However, keeping officers loyal to you can be a challenge all on its own, as each officer carries with them their own ambitions and world views. If you do too much to go against the interests of certain officers, they may end up leaving your service for another clan, or worse, outright betraying you. You can raise the loyalty of your officers through several means. The simplest way is to give them rewards. However, more effective methods include marrying them into your family or making them lord of a castle. Eventually, when your clan has grown massive, you can begin assigning officers as regents, reigning over a custom-made province. This cuts back on your actual control and workload by handing things off to a trusted retainer to govern over swaths of your territory. You can even micromanage these provinces by assigning them targets and support orders, along with other, more structural decisions and priorities. Another thing you will need to do when your clan starts to grow larger is enacting policies. Policies are large-scale decisions for your clan that have a positive and negative effect. The catch, however, is that you can only enact policies 
from your certain political view, which there are three of in the game. These being conservative, neutral, and progressive. It's important to also keep in mind that each officer has their own political view as well. So enacting certain policies that are geared towards one political view may end up angering officers who don't share that political view. Lastly, before you end your council session, don't forget to visit the merchant to stock up on supplies and treasures, and most importantly, horses and guns for your army. Once you finish your council phase, you enter into a phase where time ticks by, simulating a month passing. It's here where you can choose to march your armies, ordering them to attack enemy castles or engage enemy armies. However, the more troops you march, the more supplies you will need, as of course, soldiers need to eat. Now, battles in this game are incredibly interesting. If you choose to fight a battle instead of letting it play out on its own, it will take you down to a map with your units ready to go. The fight will play out in real time as you march your armies into positions, revealing the location of your foe, in which you will finally begin the engagement. It's best to keep your armies at a distance, as you won't suffer as high of casualties as if you were to engage in melee, where numbers drop far faster. Finally, it's also extremely important to use your officers' abilities to buff your own soldiers or weaken your enemies. If many armies from both your clan and an enemy clan are piled close together, you can receive the option to play out a major battle, which will gather all the units that are in the area for a massive epic clash. These battles are extremely intense and hair-raising, as the losing side will have all of their units completely wiped out. Laying siege to castles is also different than one would expect. Each castle has a hit points score, letting you know how strong it is and how many soldiers you will need in order to effectively surround it. It's then that the morale of its defenders will begin to drop, leading to its surrender. Of course, you can also choose to storm the castle as well, which will deal large damage to your own forces, while also bringing down the hit points of the castle. Winning or losing battles will also result in the capturing of officers, which you can then choose to either employ execute or release. Your enemies get the same options with your captured officers. It is also important to keep in mind that officers can be slain in battle as well. There is one final very epic piece of information regarding waging war with larger clans, and that is coalitions. When dealing with a great power, you can form a coalition to take them down, resulting in all of the neighboring clans either joining your side or the enemy side in a massive prolonged faction war. However, beware, because coalitions can also be formed against you. Once you conquer enough territory and begin assigning more and more regions to govern different areas of your clan, the game transforms into a game of managing your provinces as your regions continue to expand your domain. Dealing with other clans can be approached in many different manners. Smaller clans are easy to topple, yet that also makes them prime targets for vassalization, as their fear of your growing power and influence will lead them into submission to you, eventually allowing for annexation. Larger, more powerful clans are a different beast, however. Of course, you can always choose to fight them. However, if for a strategic reason you decide you do not want to go to war with a certain clan, you can always engage in diplomacy with them which can lead to requesting reinforcements, short and long-term alliances, and the most important, marriages, as a marriage between two clans guarantees an alliance between the two clans for as long as the marriage lasts. One final way you can deal with other clans happens late in the game. Once you have accepted the quest to become the new Shogun, which includes taking more territory along with the capital of Kyoto, you'll be named the new Shogun giving you access to a wide range of titles you can bestow upon other clans who will become grateful for your attention to them. This is great because it actually makes you feel like you have power as the Shogun. You can even enact a policy to end all wars, bringing a close to the Warring States period, essentially ending the game if you choose. Winning the game will give you an interesting final moment with your current daimyo while also showcasing your rise to power, 
over the years. Now, there are more great details I could get into, but that is most of the major stuff out of the way. Now, I just want to touch on a few of the minor gripes I have with the game. The first issue I have is a lack of a viewable family tree. In a game that centers itself so much around its historical samurai figures, it's kind of a bummer that we don't get a way to actually view our family trees. Don't get me wrong, there are still ways to view who your spouse and children are, but there really is no proper screen for viewing it all at once. Instead, you have to navigate to different menus in order to get your full family information. Additionally, once you grow large enough, you will have an uncountable amount of officers, which makes navigating through them to find the one you are looking for a real chore, because there is no good way to simply search for them. Another issue I have is with the game's odd lack of resources and trade. The game often brings up resources and trade, but it's really just there to fill in the background, as the gathering of resources and the trading of goods between clans is automated without your interaction. Lastly, this game is single player only, which sucks, because a multiplayer campaign in this game would be truly amazing. But that's really the only negative aspects of this game I can actually think of worth mentioning, as the game does enough good that it easily overshadows any of the other gripes that appear. So, in conclusion, I give Nobunaga's ambition, Sphere of Influence, a 10 out of 10. And I'm not fanboying when I say this, because this game really does make the amazing leaps to root itself firmly in historical accuracy and is essentially designed to be a perfect and unique depiction of the Sengoku Jidai. I strongly recommend this game if you love Japanese history, strategy games, and especially if you enjoy playing Shogun 2. However, due to its slow pace, I can imagine there are plenty of people out there who would not enjoy this game's sluggish build and tons of clan management. So really, it's a double-edged sword. As if you are interested in games with similar elements, you will probably love Sphere of Influence. While if you prefer other types of games, you most likely will want to just stay away. As for me though, I really, really enjoy this refreshing take on the period and strategy game genre. In the future, I may return to this series to make more reviews on other Nobunaga's Ambition games. And as I previously stated, I do plan on making a video comparing both Total War Shogun 2 and Nobunaga's Ambition Sphere of Influence, as they both are largely popular samurai strategy games. So, have you played Sphere of Influence? If so, let me know in the comments what you think of it. And as always, thank you for watching, and don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring that notification bell if you enjoyed this video and found it to be most entertaining.